Before we get started, I want to encourage you to subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications so that you don't miss any of the content that is released by Go Collect. And if you're interested, head over to Reggie Collects here on YouTube. Reggie here, your friendly neighborhood bodybuilder and comic book collector and the host of the Go Collect Speculation video, and I want to welcome you to another episode. In this episode, we are going to take some time to review some blog posts that touch on several different topics, including the timing of buying keys, Atlas Comics, some Snake Eyes related keys, as well as the Blue Marvel. Before we get to those blog posts, I want to tell you a bit about this week's sponsor, Wicked Monkey. Wicked Monkey is an online comic shop that offers high-grade books from both mainstream and independent publishers with a focus on the crossover between the world of comics and contemporary art. Swing by their site at wickedmonkey.co, that's wickedmonkey.co, to see their unique picks like Deep Beyond and Black Friday. Wicked Monkey, passion, dedication, art, and a touch of wickedness. They say that the best time to sell a comic is before the trailer drops. I can tell you for a fact that the best time to buy a comic is when no one is thinking about it. And that is actually the subject of our first blog post. In this post, our blogger is essentially reminding us that the trailer for the Snake Eyes movie is going to drop on July 23rd. And in advance of that, there are some Snake Eyes keys that you may want to think about picking up if you can find these books at an affordable price. And over the course of this blog post, our blogger identifies several Snake Eyes related keys that you should think about. Some of these books are pretty obvious, to be honest with you, like G.I. Joe issue number one. This is a hot book and has been hot for some time. And for a lot of people, it is outside of their price range. But there are other books that are on this list that might be well within your means and are some books that you might want to think about if you believe that there is some potential in what Hasbro is attempting to do with this new universe that they're trying to create. In addition to G.I. Joe issue number one, another book that is cited by the blogger is G.I. Joe issue number 21. Again, another hot book in many respects. This is The Silent Issue. It is a fantastic issue that I actually have in my collection, but this is also one of those books that is a little hard to find in high grade. In fact, if you look at the CGC census, there are roughly 114 copies of this book at a 9.8. This book has an FMV right now of about $1,800 at a 9.8, but it is selling for well above that right now, just shy of a $3,000 price mark. A 9.6 has an FMV of $550 and likewise is selling well above its FMV at about $1,400. But as I mentioned, there are other books on this list that are a little more affordable than the previous two, especially when you look at the origin issue, technically the two-part origin issue for Snake Eyes, which is split between G.I. Joe issue number 26 and issue number 27. There are several other books on this list that I am not going to talk about, but I will encourage you to read. Again, this trailer is dropping in July and there is still time to pick these books up if you are smart about doing so. This post is linked down in the description. Check it out. This next blog post I think is a really interesting one because it prompts people, whether they are new to the hobby or experienced collectors, to ask themselves some questions about whether now is the right time to actually buy a book. And this blog post is really written for the new collector. But again, I think that it has some applicability to all types of collectors because in this post, the blogger basically makes the statement that no one wants to buy a book at the height of its popularity and essentially overpay or to catch a brick, which is my term. But how do you know? How do you know whether a book is at its height? And in this post, there are some practical questions that are being asked of, that you should 
ask yourself, and then there's actually some practical tips that you should consider employing. When it comes to some of the questions, they include things like, is there an upcoming movie or TV show? Is this a modern spec book? How long has this book been on the rise and what is driving the value of this book? These are some very practical questions that we can all ask ourselves about purchases that we are thinking about making. At the end of the day, we have to you know, make some important decisions and, and use some critical thinking skills to ensure that if we are pulling the trigger on a comic, that we know why we are pulling the trigger. And again, this is something that is helpful for seasoned veterans all the way down to those that might be new or newly returning to the hobby. And so to that point, I think that this is a wonderful blog post for people to read because it will encourage you to think before you act. This post, like all of the others, is linked down in the description. I think it was about a year ago that Todd McFarlane made some announcements around the movie, the Spawn movie that he was going to be making. And then it was a little radio silent for quite some time until he announced that he was doing his Spawn universe, which got people all excited. And we are on the cusp of seeing some of those Spawn universe books coming out as we get closer and closer to the summer. But in this next blog post, our blogger is basically making a case for why Spawn issue number one from the 90s still remains the king of the modern day heel. And in this post, he breaks down the rationale for why this book is still king. And to do so, the blogger does a really good job of kind of analyzing some of the sales data associated with this comic. Despite the fact that it was, you know, printed in huge numbers, despite the fact that it was found in dollar bins for quite some time, this book actually has some amazing returns when you look at the data. This blog post is linked down in the description. I encourage you to check it out because there is a compelling argument that is being made here and Todd does not disappoint. Check it out. These next two blog posts are near and dear to my heart, but for completely different reasons. This first post actually takes a look at some comics from Atlas Comics, which was a short-lived spinoff from Marvel Comics back in the day. And Atlas Comics didn't last all that long, but they did manage, I think, to produce some really awesome comics that were worked on by some amazing creators. I actually covered Atlas Comics a few months ago when it was announced that Paramount actually purchased the rights to the Atlas portfolio and people are expecting that they may do something with it. They may create some maybe TV shows or maybe even movies from these characters. And again, these characters aren't widely known because Atlas Comics wasn't around all that long and most of the issues ended before the fifth issue, but there's still some awesomeness here, especially because of the creators that actually touched these books. And I was lucky enough many months ago to go out and buy a lot of these comics. But over the course of this blog post, our blogger actually examines several of the titles. One of the books highlighted is the blogger's personal favorite, Planet of Vampires. And this book was actually worked on by the legendary Neil Adams. And it has seen a positive increase in sales somewhere between 33 and 116%. Another interesting book, which is one of my favorites, is Destructor. And this book actually has some potential because this series was worked on by the legendary Steve Ditko, Wally Wood, and also Archie Goodwin. This book has actually seen an increase in sales somewhere between 12 to 96%. And while maybe none of these books are going to break any kind of records, they are really cool books to pick up from the Bronze Age, and they might have some potential to actually come to a small screen if Paramount can actually make some magic. This blog post is linked down in the description. Check it out. Who is the Blue Marvel? That is the question that is being asked by our next blogger. 
But the thing is, the blogger doesn't just answer that question. It starts there, but then it segues into potentially why the Blue Marvel may be coming to a screen and how he may or may not tie into the Fantastic Four and Galactus. It's actually a pretty cool blog post, to be honest with you. But for those that are not familiar, the Blue Marvel was actually a limited series that ran in about 2008 for five issues. And if you have not read this story, I encourage you to read it. It is a well done story. Great artwork, great storytelling, solid covers. And honestly, it is also somewhat of a hard book to find as well, especially in high grades and especially for a reasonable price because the print run was not very large. I don't think that this was a wildly, wildly popular book back in the day for whatever reason, but it is an awesome book when you actually sit down to read it. And if you're lucky enough to own it, that is a wonderful thing. When you dig into some of the data, what we see is that there are currently fewer than 200 copies of Adam, Legend of the Blue Marvel, issue number one, at a 9.8 on the CGC census. In the last year, this book has almost tripled in price. At the end of 2019, going into 2020, copies could be had for roughly $500. The current FMV for this book is sitting at about $1,800. Now, lower grade copies, and by lower grade, we mean 9.4 and 9.6, can be had for under $1,000. The second appearance of Blue Marvel, which appeared in Blue Marvel issue number two, is much more reasonable, sitting at about $450 for a 9.8. Again, really awesome story really small print run, hard to find in high grade. So if you have one, you are definitely a lucky person. There is no doubt about that. But as I mentioned, the blogger goes on to connect the Blue Marvel to Monica Rambeau because they actually had a love affair in comics. And as you all know, Monica Rambeau is coming to the stage and she appeared in the recent WandaVision show. She's going to be in the Captain Marvel movie that is coming up. She is headed off into space. And because of her connection to the Blue Marvel, that introduces the possibility of the Ultimates coming on the scene. The Ultimates were a space-based team. She's headed into space. This could introduce the, the Ultimates. And if they are in space, that might open the door to Galactus because Galactus and the Ultimate and Monica Rambo and the Blue Marvel had some things going on in the comics, which also then ties into the Fantastic Four. And again, this article started off just talking about who the Blue Marvel was, and now we have a connection to Galactus, the Fantastic Four, Monica Rambo, all of which are potentially on the docket to come into the movies a solid blog post to check out because there's some awesome dots that are being connected. This blog post is down in the description. Give it a read and let me know what you think. So there you have it. We have reached the end of another episode. If you enjoyed this episode, I definitely want to encourage you to leave a comment behind, hit the thumbs up button and tune in next week when we get to do this all over again. 